Uh, and thank you for, for having me back. Always a pleasure to be here. As, as I say, it's a part of the way I mark the year and the uh, an, an annual event that I look forward to. And I look forward to uh, at some point getting back uh, together in person uh, for this. Uh, though I thought today, uh, given the, you know, to make the best of the limitations of Zoom, but also what it offers. Uh, so in my talk today, I'm going to use uh, several videos uh, to kind of demonstrate the ideas I, I want to discuss. Uh, and we had that set up and hope, hopefully that'll go seamlessly as I transition back and forth between the talk and, and the videos. Uh, but we'll see how that works. All right. Uh, so... Because I, I have spoken several times here, as I said, my pleasure on, on Darwin Day. Uh, and today's topic, you know, my, my title of my talk today is really taking Darwin seriously, some radical implications. And really taking Darwin seriously means accepting the continuity of life on the planet. Right. Uh, and that continuity, we're familiar, you know, comfortable talking, more comfortable talking about in terms of the genetic continuity, uh, physical continuity. Uh, but today I want to talk about the continuity in terms of mind. Right. Uh, so there's a quote I often start with. It's from the conclusion of The Origin of Species, uh, where, where Darwin puts on his prophetic hat. Uh, and he says, in the distant future, I see open fields for more important researches. Psychology will be based on a new foundation. And this is the key for today's talk. That of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation. Right? So Darwin is predicting that as the development of evolutionary science uh, continues, it will encompass not just our physical being, but our mental powers as well. Uh, and of course, one of the implications of that is that there is not a clear distinction uh, between the mental and the physical. That's the topic for another time. Uh, but I think it's, it's clear that Darwin was right about that. Uh, and in terms of the study of human uh, intelligence, the human mind, uh, that is, is done at, within the context of an evolutionary perspective, whether uh, and much of it is done explicitly looking at the evolution of uh, not only our brain, but of the capacities of the brain, the various, uh, again, as he says, mental powers that the brain is able to generate. And this is something that's been the foundation of my talk over the last several years, looking at the ways that uh, our evolutionary history and the pressures of natural selection uh, have shaped the human brain, uh, the human mind. And I'm, of course, particularly have been interested in our moral capacities, uh, looking at things like our ability to empathize and limitations on empathy, uh, and seeing how that is something that has developed out you know, across our evolutionary history. So today I want to shift the perspective a bit. Uh, so in, in the past, we started with the idea that we want to look at how it is that the, the, the mind, the mental capacities, the intelligence we have today uh, could have arisen from an evolutionary process. Uh, now I want to turn back and start with right, the powers we have, the mind we have, and look back at you know, the origins of that, this, this final product. So my, the, the issue is to look back and see where, can we, as we look back in evolutionary history, can we pinpoint when did intelligence begin, right? When did, the, the, when did consciousness begin, right? When did we develop the ability for emotional uh, connections and empathy? Uh, in particular, I, I wanna look at the issue of intelligence, uh, largely because that's easier to study and we can have more empirical evidence uh, on that, right? For the sake of our discussion, uh, intelligence we're going to understand as the ability, ability to act adaptively in novel situations. So uh, of course, all creatures act adaptively, right? In order to be, all the creatures on the planet today are the successful descendants of species that learn to adapt uh, to changing environments. When we talk about intelligence, uh, we want to distinguish it from something that's just genetically sort of determined. I'm not, I'm not thrilled with that term, or something that's uh, you know perhaps just learned through mimicry, uh, or 
trial and error, you know, moves us toward intelligence. We want to look at something that's more flexible, right? Behavior, you know, responses to the environment, and particularly novel environments that show some flexibility, right? So we're going to take that as signs of, you know, an advanced cog of cognition and of intelligent behavior. So uh, again, that's the question we want to look at today. How far back do we have to look uh, to find the origins, right? The, the first uh, embers of, uh, as it says, of the fire of the mind. Uh, and that's what we're going to look back. So the idea that animals, uh, at least some animals, right, have minds or have intelligence uh, is widely accepted today. Uh, and that it has not always been. And that was, in fact, one of the radical implications of, of Darwin. Uh, in, in Darwin's day, you know, by that point, and since really the beginning of modern Western philosophy and thought, animals were seen as basically biological machine. And, and this goes back to Descartes in the, in the 17th century, right? Uh, animals were made of biological matter that functioned like a machine, levers and pulleys and hydraulic systems. Uh, and their behavior could be explained hypothetically on purely mechanical grounds, right? Uh, no mind needed. Humans were distinct by having a mind. And Descartes put all the wonderful things about humanity in this immaterial, distinct uh, substance, mind. And of course, that fits in very well with many religious conceptions, particularly Christianity that sees, you know, that humans are unique in being endowed with a soul, right? God had breathed his spirit into Adam. And this, you know, raises us above the animal kingdom and brings us closer to the angels and God, right? And so that is something, an, an immaterial soul. So the notion that animals might uh, share in this human quality of intelligence, thought, empathy, uh, morality, uh, was just off the table in, in, for much of early modern history. But that is beginning to change you know, in the 19th century uh, as you know, ethology and more scientific studies of animals are, are happening. Uh, but a major shift is Darwin. Right, if Darwin is putting humans in this evolutionary history, uh, then it opens up as he sees right the possibility that even these most exalted human characteristics uh, have uh, a, an evolutionary history, are grounded in this natural process, and then maybe shared with other animals. So we said today, you know, we're, we're comfortable with the idea of uh, particularly higher social mammals like chimpanzees. Uh, elephants, uh, dolphins, uh, as, as highly intelligent creatures. And an intelligence and a mind that's different from human, but clearly complex, uh, you know, flexible, and, and, and impressive very much in their own ways. All right, so what I wanna to do today is we'll push past those, you know, higher animals and see how far back we go before we can find you know, a lack of intelligence, or or how far back we go and see evidence uh, of intelligence, right? So uh, chimpanzees are our closest evolutionary uh, uh, cousins. Uh, they we we that we share about over ninety eight percent of our genes with chimpanzees, and we diverged from a common ancestor about six million years ago. Take give or take a million years. So let's push it back further. And, and here the evidence is also pretty clear uh, that not just chimpanzees, but primates in, in general uh, show signs of intelligence and, and some cognitive flexibility, uh, emotional connections, empathetic responses, uh, and even the, the building blocks of morality. Right? So not morality in the developed philosophical, theological, uh, humanistic way we use that term, but in terms of having some moral sense of care for others, uh, an appreciation of certain uh, principles of fairness and equity. Uh, we, evidence shows we can find this in, in other primates, pushing pa back past chimps. Uh, you may very well be familiar with Franz Duval, uh, famous primatologist, uh, uh, author of numerous bestsellers on uh, you know, sort of the, the, the lives, the mental lives, the moral lives of animals, particularly chimpanzees. Well, he's also pushed this back that it's not just chimpanzees, we can look even further back. And so here I want to share a, a video that uh, this is a very good chance that uh, many of you have seen this. 
uh, it, it, I say to my class, I anytime I can, I share this with the class. Is it something everybody should see once? Uh, but it's a study that uh, Franz Laval and, and some of his students were doing uh, on with capuchin monkeys. Uh, and I'll, I'll let I'll let Franz Laval take it from there. So I'm going to share the screen and hope that this works. Uh, Okay, actually, uh, I right, to do this first. And then let me go back to sharing the screen. Does this show up? Yes, okay. And okay. Uh, and somebody signal me if, if the volume's not working, if there's any, any technical problems here. This is Franz Zubel. I don't hear it, John. Hold on a sec. Okay. All right, uh, I think I know what to do here. Let me just. Uh... I think you have to optimize video and, and screen sound. Yeah, so I have to go back to the share. So that's right. Uh, all right. As I said, this, this would be seamless, right? I hope we'll get this problem out of the way now. So uh, share sound, optimize video clip. Okay, I think that should do it. Originally, with capuchin monkeys, and uh, I'm going to show yes. you the. Good. Can Good. you hear it now? It's fine. It's working. Okay. Let me just move it back a little bit then. Okay. That I want to mention to you is our fairness study, uh, and so this 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 became a very famous study, and there's now many more because after we did this about ten years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known, and we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. <laughs> OK, so I, again, just that's it. <laughs> just an entertaining uh, clip, but it, it is really showing some higher level cognitive uh, processing, right? So uh, there, it, it's, it's showing a preference, right? That there's a, a qualitative distinction between, you know, the, the cucumber and the, uh, the grape, but more importantly, a, an awareness of how the other monkey is being treated and how it's being treated, the, the unhappy monkey. Uh, and, you know, giving up food uh, out of the sense that you know, we're, we're projecting the term fairness, but recognizing that it's not being treated in the way the other monkey was being treated and not accepting that behavior. And, and I love the second where it's, it's, it's tapping the rock. Maybe there was something wrong with the rock. That's why I didn't get the, the better, uh, 
the better gift, uh, the better treat. So, you know, uh, this is a capuchin monkeys are further related. They, they stretch back. Our last common an ancestors with capuchins goes back about 30 million years. Uh, and this is clearly, you know, el evidence of some sort of mind, right? Some sort of mind. Um, all right, so well, we're still in the uh, primate family there. Uh, again, this is what we, how far back can we push that? Uh, what about non-mammals, right? So non-mammals, uh, I want to look at, and let me just set up the screen again, uh, looking at birds, right? And specifically, uh, no, I gotta, sorry. Oh, sorry, one second. Specifically corvids, all right? These, these is the, the, the uh, branch of the birds that include ravens and crows. Uh, and I don't know if it's happening here, excuse me. Okay. Not to share. Uh, and, and back to the share. Okay, uh, so, uh, so now we, we've moved away from, from the you know, social mammals and we're looking at birds. So this is an example, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the intelligence of uh, crows and, and ravens. Everyone knows crows are smart. They recognize faces, they can make and use tools. But how smart and how do they learn? That's where one of Aesop's fables comes in. It's the one about a thirsty crow that dropped stones in a pitcher in order to raise the water level so it was high enough to get a drink. Seems unlikely. But in fact, experiments have shown that New Caledonian crows, once they're trained to pick up and drop stones, which is not something they do a lot in the wild, can figure out this problem pretty quickly. They use the stones to raise the water level to get a piece of floating food. Some other kinds of birds can do this too, and humans, once they reach about age five. In this latest set of experiments, the crows showed some new tricks. They picked out sinking over floating objects to raise the water level, and solid over hollow objects. They didn't do well with wide versus narrow tubes, and if part of the whole tube apparatus was hidden, then they weren't able to figure it out. So it seems that crows really need to see the cause and effect in order to understand the problem. What's the moral of the story? More research is needed, of course, in order to figure out exactly how crows learn and think. Okay, uh, back to you. Okay, so again, intelligent behavior. This is not a, a, a challenge COVID, so the crows find in nature, right? So they're, learned, they're taught how to pick up the rocks, but they're not uh, coming across food stuck inside tubes in nature. So they're able to problem solve this. Uh, and as the experiments you know, uh, vary the conditions uh, to make this, discriminations between which would be the better objects to, to, to drop in there. So this is very flexible, creative, intelligent behavior. Uh, another you know, uh, piece of evidence in terms of, of COVID intelligence is their uh, cacheting of food. So uh, when crows are, are you know, just as you know, squirrels find food and they hide the food for, uh, for winter, so they have food later, uh, crows do something similar. But instead of you know, burying their food in one place, crows will drop their foods at different spots over quite an extensive area. And they, they, the studies have shown they can drop these in dozens and dozens and dozens of spots, all right, and come back months later and remember where all the food is. 
But this is very high level intelligence. And as researchers said, this, this is showing a kind of intelligence that was thought only to be possessed by humans, right? Uh, not only episodic memory, a tremendous you know, me you know, memory storage, uh, the ability to plan and anticipate uh, uh, where, where where the best place to drop the food, to drop the food and hide it so it's not being found. Uh, this is all very high level cognitive work being done by non-mammals, right? Uh, so crows, you know, as, as, and birds, just get these. Okay. Uh, the, the evolutionary split between COVIDs and corvids, not COVIDs, corvids and humans, uh, the last common ancestor was about 300 million years ago. All right, so that's pushing back, right? You know, signs of intelligence, right? Or the origins of intelligence, uh, uh, at least 300 million years, right? So uh, that's fine, but we're still here dealing with uh, land animals, birds. Let, what, what if we went into the sea? What, what, what do we see about intelligence in the water? Uh, and there's, again, a lot of interesting thing be, things being done on fish. Uh, but again, this is something you may know about the most interesting research, the most fascinating uh, and kind of mind bending research is being done uh, on the octopus. Uh, there's a very famous, or, you know, or not famous, popular Netflix show, My Octopus Teacher, which is very interesting, but there's a lot of, you know, you, you can find tons of documentaries and clips on YouTube uh, about octopus intelligence. Uh, I just want to look, uh, share one with you. Uh, Again, so I think hopefully I have this one set up right. Um, screen, the COVIDs. Okay. All right, uh, so uh, this is an experiment. This is the end of a, of a, of a very interesting documentary. Uh, I think it's a BBC documentary. Uh, and so they're gonna see if, if you know, octopus can learn by observing other octopus. Uh, this is not something that octopus would do in the wild because octopus or octopuses are solitary creatures, right? They, they don't live in groups. Uh, they, they spend their whole lives as individuals. So there has been no evolutionary sort of pressure to be able to learn from other octopuses uh, on no occasions in the wild to practice this type of skill. So this is a completely novel task that's being given to uh, an octopus. And just as so they, they have trained one octopus to be able to unscrew uh, a uh, lid on a box, is a, a transparent box, you'll see this, uh, and there's several ways to get in. And inside is this uh, tasty morsel uh, a crab. So they've trained one octopus to do this, and then they're going to have it do it while another octopus in a different tank is observing or not. Uh, so let's start with that. What would happen if we place? We gotta share it. I gotta share it. Uh, I, people can see this. Yes, John. Everything is fine. Okay. All right. Thank you. To two octopuses face to face. One who knows how to open the container and the other who doesn't. We wanted to know if one octopus could learn by observing the other. We created a box with three openings. The difference between the three openings is how they open. With the first opening, the cover simply lifts off. With the second opening, you have to twist open the cover. You have to twist it first and then pull it off. And the last cover also pulls off, but it doesn't come off completely. We place a crab in the box and then we wait to see what happens. In the lab, the tanks are divided into two by a glass wall. A box with a crab in it is placed in one. Also in that tank is Candide, an octopus that was caught by a fisherman just that morning. Candide sees the crab, but doesn't react. This is exactly what the researchers expected. The experiment can proceed.
In the other side of the tank, the same kind of box is given to an octopus that has spent a few days in the lab and has learned how to get into the multiple opening box. This octopus is called the trainee. It immediately starts to open the box to get at the prey. Candide watches the trainee. His curiosity is aroused. The trainee isn't wasting its time. Candide is visibly excited and is clearly trying to understand what the octopus is doing. Finally, the trainee octopus opens the box and seizes the crab. Has Candide really learned by observing the trainee? Will he prove the Capri theory right? It's a crucial moment for Graziano and David. They won't have to wait long. Now the glass panel between the two tanks is covered over, preventing the octopuses from seeing each other. Candide is left alone with the problem. Is he going to succeed? Without hesitating, Candide grapples with the box and manages to get it open in barely a few seconds. He's observed and he's understood. The experiment is repeated dozens of times and the box is placed in different positions. The octopus always opens it on the same side using the same opening, showing that he didn't simply learn to imitate a movement, he really understood what had to be done. It seems that the octopus is about to take a leap ahead in the evolutionary scheme. There may be no holding back its formidable. Okay. It, it gets a, it gets a bit uh, overly dramatic at the end there. Uh, so again, what the uh, the um, the study of the octopus is, is just uh, literally, literally blowing our understanding of intelligence out of the water. Uh, forgive the pun. When this, people, this research is studying intelligence in in, in, in non-human creatures and the, the evolution of human intelligence, uh, have have said that there seem to be two. Um, conditions that provide sort of the uh, environmental pressure toward greater and greater intelligence, right? Uh, and that is social complexity and longevity. So creatures that live in social groups uh, need a greater intelligence to manage the complexity of the relationships in the group, uh, to know how to coordinate behavior between group members. I mean, the, the advantage of living in a group is uh, in terms of, you know, foraging resources, protect, protection from predators, uh, you know, mutual care of offspring, uh, all those are all complex social relationships. And so a higher intelligence is needed to facilitate that. Uh, also uh, long lived uh, species uh, then are, are, are able to learn more, right? You know, from the environment are, are going to live in environments that change more over the course of their lifespan than short-lived uh, species. Uh, and so higher intelligence is going to be you know, correlated and, and it's found to be correlated with longer lived species, right? Uh, this is where the octopus is a complete outlier. As I said, again, they're solitary creatures. They live on their own. Uh, uh, they're born on their own. There's no maternal care uh, once they're born. Uh, and they're short-lived. They live on average about two years, right? Uh, and, and yet their uh, cognitive abilities uh, are truly impressive. I, I won't go into it more because I said there's plenty of resources on, on the web and on YouTube uh, to see this uh, for yourself, but they're truly imp impressive uh, intellectual abilities. So that's really changing the way we're starting to think about intelligence and, and you know, you know, how, what, what is, uh, what are the conditions, right? What are the natural, the environmental conditions that are, that are leading toward uh, higher and higher intelligence? Uh, and this is also, again, pushing back the, you know, uh, elements of intelligence uh, even further. Our, our last common ancestor with the octopus was about 750 million years ago, 750 million years ago. Right. Uh, so in terms of, and we'll, we'll continue to see how far we can push this back, actually, we'll, we'll push it even further back than that. Uh, so that, that, that notion, that model of intelligence being social complexity 
and uh, longevity uh, is, you know, the octopus is an exception, but is a, a fairly robust uh, correlation. Uh, and it is the complexity. It's not just the size of the group. The size of the group is important, but we know that there are other creatures that live in more, you know, uh, larger groups than humans and chimpanzees and, and elephants and dolphins do, and that are the youth social insects, ants, bees, you know, wasps, uh, and uh, these are you know, incredibly social animals, uh, but the, the general consensus is that, uh, well, there seems to be such a thing as, you know, a hive intelligence, right? An intelligence of the colony, right? That the, as a unit, uh, the, again, the, the, the colony, the hive shows adaptive behavior, but the sense had been that the individual ants and bees are basically genetically programmed automatons. They're just following out their genetic code. And as you may anticipate now, because I wouldn't be bringing this up if that, if that were true, uh, uh, the evidence is, is there's, there's starting to be evidence to show that that's not the case. And this is specifically looking at the bees, right? The study of bees uh, and showing that bees have a, a much, much greater brain power as this video is, is going to make the point, uh, the individual bees than anticipated. Uh, so there have been uh, you know, a series of experiments uh, you know, testing bees in completely sort of novel situations to see their ability to learn, uh, to develop novel behaviors uh, that, that, that don't fit into uh, their, uh, you know, typical foraging behavior. So uh, that's, let me set that up here. Uh, sorry, just put that down there. Come back to this. There. Why is that not there? Okay, it is there. Share. Share that. And okay. Uh, so it's a, a study on. Has a humble bumblebee has a surprisingly flexible brain. They can come up with the most efficient solution to receive a reward rather than simply mimicking what they see others do. Bees were taught to move a ball to the center of a platform. If successful, they got a sugary treat. They were taught by other bees, by fake bees held by scientists, or by invisible ghost bees, actually a magnet. They didn't learn so well from the ghost bees. Real bees were better teachers. Rather than mimicking the conditions they were shown, bees went off script to solve problems. The demonstrations they learned from all involved yellow balls. This ball is black, not yellow, but the bee still chooses it as the closest ball to the center. She knows she doesn't need a yellow ball specifically. Any ball will do to solve the problem. This kind of cognitive flexibility is previously unknown in insects. Clever girls. Let me just get rid of that so this for a second. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that you know, there's again uh, not not a behavior required in the environment. They're learning. Uh, they're they're learning better by observing other bees. Right? Uh, so that shows that their behavior is not just simply genetically programmed, uh, and they're varying how they get the ball into the the middle of the uh, the experimental design. Uh, there have been other experiments showing that bees can distinguish between colors, which makes sense, but also between concepts. Now, it's not saying that they have these conceptual representations, but there are studies showing that bees, you know, again, the, the very similar design of the, the experimental design, where bees have to choose one of two pads to get food, uh, and the pads are marked with uh, different shapes, uh, triangles or circles. 
right? And the bees are able to distinguish and learn that. Uh, but they're also then able to you know, generalize from that in which in one case, it's a number of circles, three circles versus two triangles. And it's the uh, quantity, right? That the higher quantity gets them to the food. So uh, again, you know, showing is suggesting an ability of, you know, that goes beyond simply recognizing uh, smells, colors. There, there's there's a, a, a greater discrimination uh, ability in the bee uh, brain, and this is with you know a, a powerful brain, but a much smaller brain. Bees have about a million neurons in their brain. Humans have about 80 billion. Uh, so it's a much smaller brain, but what it, what's interesting about the bee brain is that it's incredibly tightly packed and densely interconnected. Uh, and we know that that's an important part of intelligence, you know, uh, of, of the processing power of a brain, connections between uh, the neurons. Okay, and so with bees, you know, this, if we're accepting this as signs uh, of intelligence, then we, we're pushing back the possible origins uh, of intelligence to about 600 million years ago, last common ancestor, ancestor between insects uh, and mammals. So and we, we've pushed it back, you know, deep, deep into our evolutionary history. Uh, but is, is that the beginning of, you know, intelligence? Is that the first point? And uh, again, the answer, the evidence is suggesting no, right? And uh, it's also suggesting that intelligence is not just something that animals do. So I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, there have been several books, uh, you know, popular books published on this subject, looking at the possibility of intelligence or you know, uh, advanced or complex cognitive work on the part of plants, right? Uh, and particularly trees. And this is work that was pioneered several decades ago by Susan uh, Simard. And uh, you know, she has a, a, a very popular book out now called Searching for the Mother Tree or in search of the mother tree, uh, but there's a, you know, a, a growing body of research looking into you know, adaptive behavior and sharing of intelligence uh, among trees in a forest. So I have a video on that. We'll just take a look at, quick look at that and we'll discuss some more. So the idea of tree intelligence. Okay, I'm sorry, do I have this set up? Trees may look like solitary individuals, but the ground beneath our feet tells a different story. Trees are secretly talking, trading and waging war on one another. They do this using a network of fungi that grow around and inside their roots. The fungi provide the trees with nutrients and in return they receive sugars. But scientists have found this connection runs far deeper than first thought. By plugging into the fungal network, trees can share resources with each other. The system has been nicknamed the Wood Wide Web. It's thought that older trees, fondly known as mother trees, use this fungal network to supply shaded seedlings with sugars, giving them a better chance of survival. Those trees that are sick or dying may dump their resources into the network, which might then be used by healthier neighbours. Plants also use fungi to send messages to one another. If they're attacked, they can release chemical signals through their roots, which can warn their neighbours to raise their defences. But like our internet, the wood wide web has its dark side too. Some orchids hack the system to steal resources from nearby trees. And other species, like the black walnut, spread toxic chemicals through the network to sabotage their rivals. Arboreal cybercrime aside, scientists are still debating why plants seem to behave in such an altruistic way. The hidden network creates a thriving community between individuals. When you're next in woodland, you might like to think of trees as part of a big super organism, chatting and swapping information and food under your feet. And so this is clearly a more uh, radical notion, a more con controversial notion. So just you know, to talk about it a bit. So uh, the the claim for you know 
intelligence uh, in, in trees in a forest uh, comes from the sharing of information and resources through the, that my, mycelial network that runs underneath the, uh, the forest floor. Uh, so, you know, trees share, again, as the video is saying, nutrients, water, uh, and the and there's a symbiotic relationship. The fungi are getting sugars from the trees, right? And that's what they're developing in this network. Uh, what, you know, lends itself toward an interpretation as intelligent behavior is that, you know, the resources are not necessarily just shared arbitrarily, uh, randomly. Uh, you know, and studies show that, that trees will... Uh, that resources will be directed toward uh, trees, in some cases, trees that are of the same species. Sometimes the species doesn't matter. Uh, that trees will you know, preferentially send resources to you know, their offspring, you know, trees that have uh, developed from this, their own seedlings. Uh, that trees will, that injured trees will also be cared for by having resources shared from the community. Uh, Dying trees will release all of their resources into uh, that network, so that that's shared throughout. Again, throughout the the, the connected uh, <laughs> with wide web, uh, and you know, it's in other, other trees will use use this to uh, compete with with competitive competing trees. So this is really changing the whole science of uh, trees and and managing forests, and that, that's where a lot of this research started. The prevailing logic had been, you know, for a healthy forest, you need to have trees spaced far apart so they weren't competing for light and that they weren't competing for water and sources. They were seeing trees as competitors. And so you wanted to give them their own space. And that turns out to be the, exactly the worst thing to do uh, for healthy trees. Uh, and again, study shows that, you know, trees that are, are grown in, you know, that, that sort of more isolated ways are more likely to, to uh, fall over in a storm than trees uh, that are part of this connected network. Uh, that the way to develop a healthy forest is to allow the trees, you know, to develop naturally, the spacing of the tree to develop naturally, uh, because they're not necessarily in competition. There's a level of cooperation. Again, the suggestion is not that this is planned out, that this is intentional in the way that humans might, uh, but that the behavior that's happening uh, is, is not simply uh, a biochemical reaction. There seems to be, again, some uh, discrimination about how resources are shared uh, when and, and, and to which trees. Uh, trees will also send out warning signals uh, through uh, this network. So other tree, if they're being attacked you know, by uh, parasites or insects, uh, so other trees can send out uh, you know, protective uh, toxins of their own. Uh, so again, a lot of very interesting work, again, clearly much more uh, controversial because we, we've now pushed the idea of intelligence and cognition so far beyond uh, the human model, right? But that, that is part of, you know, the radical implications of, of Darwin is that we can't take the human as the model. Uh, we can't see the, the, hum, human, the, the human example as somehow distinct from, separate from, discontinuous with the rest of nature. And so if we are going to really take Darwin seriously, we have to take seriously that notion of continuity uh, and to, and to you know, give up our pretensions to having these traits that clearly different in degree, but are not necessarily different in kind, right? Uh, and that, and our, our most, you know, pride, the, the, the quality we have taken most pride in, our, our intelligence, right? We are, that's our species. We are homo sapiens, like the wise uh, human, right? The wise creature. Uh, if, if we free ourselves from those more anthropocentric biases about what counts as intelligence and wisdom, uh, we, we are seeing growing evidence of wisdom, intelligent behavior, uh, deep, deep into our evolutionary history. Uh, uh, the last common ancestors between trees and humans goes back 2 billion years. Right? We're a little closer to the fungi and the fungi seem to be playing an important role in this. Uh, perhaps the, the essential role in this and our last ancestor with the fungi with mushrooms is over a billion years, right? So is that it then? Have, have, have you know, so it, we, if we're, we're pushing the idea of you know, an origin of, con of consciousness of intelligence back billions of years, right? Can we say we've reached 
an endpoint, or perhaps is the lesson that there is no endpoint, right? And here, here's the really radical implication of this. Uh, and I'm saying, again, it's an implication. I'm not saying this is established uh, science. Uh, there are scientists who are making this case. And, and, and that is, you know, and, and the, 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 the theory is called the life-mind continuity thesis, life-mind continuity. And the, the basic you know, motto or maxim of that is where there's life, there's mind, right? Again, mind, again, we have to free ourselves of the human bias. It's, it's not a mind like ours, right? Because other creatures would need a mind like ours because each creature is developing its abilities, its capacities based on its own evolutionary history and its own needs, right? So if there's, there's, there's no foundation to think that it's going to be like a human mind. But the idea that all other creatures uh, are simply mindless matter following some genetic or physicochemical uh, algorithm is really being challenged here. It's really being challenged. Uh, and because the idea is that life itself, you know, you know, entails some sense, some ability to sense the environment, right? Uh, to dis make discriminations in the environment and to respond adaptively and perhaps uh, you know, not in a novel way uh, to the environment. Uh, I, don't, I don't have, I'm done with the video for today. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a video on this, uh, but just to show you how far back this is being pushed, uh, there's, a, you know, and advocates of this life mind uh, will look at you know studies of single cell organisms, bacteria, nematodes, and one thing we know about single cell organisms uh, is that they are not just being buffeted about by you know environmental forces, uh, that they you know have the ability to change direction, right? They have this uh, rotating uh, tail that can move them, and that they will move away from toxins in their environment and toward food sources, glucose, right? This is what they, they consume, glucose. So there's at least a discrimination between an ability to sense, have some, some discrimination between toxins and, and sugar. Now, of course, that, that really is getting down to what seems to be a basic chemical reaction. And again, this is all open for, for discussion, debate, uh, but there's, there's a, a recent study that's showing that some single cell uh, organisms show a preference for food sources. That is, a study showed that once it's been exposed to a high quality source of glucose, right? So that it is a rich source of glucose, uh, that they will bypass inferior glucose concentrations, uh, seemingly in search of the higher concentration. And that doesn't seem to be you know, clearly a result of simple chemical responses, right? Uh, they're bypassing food. And that's not something organisms who are successful in their evolutionary struggle do, right? Uh, bypassing food. Uh, but bypassing a, a lower quality food for a higher quality food. What, what is allowing them to determine that, that difference? Is unclear, and, and again, now we're really, really pushed. Right? I said this would be the radical implications, uh, but there are arguments being made by scientists and, and philosophers who study this uh, about that. There's even on this level, some very simple, rudimentary ability to sense its environment for an organism, as even a single cell organism, to have a sense of its environment and respond adaptively. All right, so uh, that's that's the, the thesis. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, are you able to stick around for a while? Because I think there's loads of questions and comments. The videos were absolutely mind boggling. So if I can ask that you'll stick around for a bit after we finish up. Sure. Just my last point, uh, and, and that's just a conclusion is, and I'm happy to stick around, is this is you know, the message that I, I think we keep taking from Darwin is that, you know, we are, you know, completely natural creatures, which you know was very upsetting to many people when in Darwin's day and continues. But what Darwin is showing us is that we are completely at home in in the environment, and uh, our connections, you know, uh, to the rest of nature go very deep uh, and are, you know, very extensive. Uh, I hopefully hopefully one of the things that you know an appreciation of Darwin does in terms of humanism, or I think it does, is it teaches us humility, right? 
uh, in the face of nature, but also a sense of, of deeper connection and, and a sense of being at home in nature. All right, with that, I'll stop. And uh, yes, I'm happy to stick around and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, John. What a fascinating presentation.